Yeah, the TV garden. It sounds like you're talking about my TV garden. Oh, oh, is that what it's called? Yeah, so it, <laughs> it was my brother's idea, uh, Shoot Van Barber. Okay. Um, yeah. Where's he been at, by the way? He's been out in Arizona. He's, He's just, just clean and shit? Yeah, pre-COVID, he went out there. He was uh, getting back into like the Van Barber shit. Okay. Like <laughs> literally traveling around in his van cutting hairs. Um, what? That's why he, I mean, he changed his name. That's not his real name. Um, like, so when he ran away from home, went out to Arizona, he was a freelance barber for a little while. And what? I thought he just vacuumed. I thought he was just a cleaner. Well, so he got into some trouble. Because you know the like the old Floby, like the haircutting thing. It's like basically a vacuum. Yeah, yeah, the vacuum that sucks and cuts it. (laughs) He he was trying to like make his own versions of that, and uh, he was doing a demonstration on this kid and basically ripped this kid's scalp off. What? um, And ended up getting blacklisted from the barber community in Arizona. What's up, everybody? We are back. This is the 13th Dropcast, and we have the perfect um, guest for number 13. I don't know if it's going to be Why is that? You know. You have a 13th compadre. Lucky lucky number 13. Yeah, because you're weird, so it works with the weird number, too. (laughs) 13's a weird number? Some people are scared of it. Suspicious? Well, I guess so. It's okay. What is a weirder number than 13? But weird is also... um, Pi. That is a weird number. Weird's also relative. So weird is just a cop out way how of explaining different something. You are I mean, 13 could else. be someone else's favorite number. It's true. Well, his name is Matt Wilkin. He's a good friend of ours. Um, he's helped us a lot at the beginning of our you know, film career and also throughout. Like, we just got done with a bunch of cool gigs. Yeah, I mean, we constantly work with, with Matt. Um, he's a great tool and asset to have at Drop Creative and. Mm-hmm. Yeah, doing constant projects with him and involving him in any way, shape, or form that we can and when we can. It's yeah. great working with you guys, so happy yeah. to be here. Yeah, we're happy to have you. <laughs> um, so we're kind of back after a small hiatus. I mean, Drop kind of had to step away from the podcast just because we had so many other projects going on, and it's really hard to schedule these things with everybody and get everything aligned. We were going to do this another week, but then I was sick. It wasn't COVID, so we're good. We're, we're back in it, baby. Um, I mean, it was just like the this is the the calm after the storm. I mean, we had mm. five projects staying there in the in the oven there, trying to bounce them back and forth and and meet deadlines. Um, all mm. of which I was about this man was helped on out every on, single so, one of them. Um, yeah, it was a lot. We've what been we living behind Premiere in the in the Adobe Suite, which yeah. I've been thinking about the Adobe Suite. If there was like a an actual Adobe suite. like hotel or like suite. That would be epic for you could go there, like your company could pay you to go there and just like the Adobe say, presidential suite. You say, I'm yeah, you got, well, Adobe I mean, like suite. each, each like hotel room or suite, you know, has, uh, has, uh, like a fully beefed out computer and yeah. loaded up with all your stuff and yeah. bing bow. And it doesn't sweet. crash. And it doesn't crash. Yeah. It's like no matter somehow, what you do, somehow you do it doesn't. Yeah. It's just everything they, runs flawlessly. They have like the best version. They have everything that editors need, like a mini fridge full of LaCroix, a bunch of vape epic. juice all on the wall, snacks. Adobe. Hey, juice. Please. A jacuzzi. Give me a bowl of grapes. <laughs> yeah. Is that your editing go-to? Snack? <laughs> well, if I'm going to sit down for like a good six, seven hours, yeah. It's whole, like whole bag of grapes? Just a big old bowl of it. Big you old, know? Yeah. Okay. It's one at a time, so you know it takes a while to eat them. There's a little bit of hydration, a little bit of sugar. Yeah. Do you peel the skin off in your mouth when you eat a grape? Or do that's you just kind of chomp it? I, I There's different just, techniques to eat the grape. Dirty. I, I usually just chomp that. it like a shrimp. You know, like I like the pop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. The baby's thumb, as some people might call it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like you're just biting off Frodo's finger. Yeah. And it's kind of like with edamame. I eat edamame pretty weird. Like I'll out of the pod, you know. So you like it. a lot of tongue action with well, your... Well, no, I just eat it, but then like there's this little like skin on the edamame <clears> that I mm-hmm. almost every single time I eat a bean... I take off you that little skin. Tongue, mouth, you know, Can you tie a cherry with your tongue? A cherry now? I don't think. I mean, like, maybe if I spent, like, two, 20 minutes with it, probably. But I'm not, like, boop, boop, boop. I bet you could. I can't make out that good. With the skills that you're <laughs> saying that you have, I bet you could just, you could probably surprise yourself. Um, well, yeah, so what did we just do with Matt? We did a bunch of Cranbrook stuff. We actually, unfortunately, just did kind of a lot of boring stuff. It was fun, but, like, they were all interviews. Hours and hours and hours of interviews. 
a lot of you interviews. gotta do a lot of boring stuff to pay for the the fun stuff. The fun stuff. It's true. Exactly. It's true. Um we went to Georgia and worked with this one company and interviewed all the people from that company and in got the to middle learn. of nowhere, Georgia. Um, oh yeah. We were in the sticks. There was a guy there who had a more intense mullet than I've ever had or ever thought was even possible from the human race. Yeah, and the the story behind that mullet too is pretty pretty remarkable. What was I it? I think I was blown away. He had he was a cancer survivor. Oh yeah, for like the, four years. Yeah. But he grew the mullet the whole entire time. That hair didn't fall off throughout chemo, yeah. and he just kept it. And like that's badass. That's yeah, so that cool. Pretty badass. The power in the mullet, baby, and all the cancers in remission. If I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, no, I think he was. Yeah. It was, he was probably the mullet, man. There's power in the there, mullet. There is power yeah. in the mullet. And Definitely. Too bad yours is gone. Yeah, I, I think with the mullet died a deeper, darker side of me that I needed to just put away in a box for now. Have you That's have good. you noticed less power in your day to day life? Um, just a loss of control in general. Oh, I don't think it. I don't think it was power. I think it was just chaotic energy, and I have oh, noticed it brought on chaotic. Yes, energy. I have noticed a huge lack of chaotic energy, and I'm like happy with it. Uh, you know. It's one it was of those like things. a little little devil resting on your shoulder, just kind of whispering, like, "Yeah, go to the bar, yeah. go drink." <laughs> Not even that, or just like you're in public and some old lady with like smoking a cigarette in a uh, little wheelchair thing. Like, like go a, bum one. No, like a scooter wheelchair. No, not go bum a cigarette <laughs> off her. She would just be like, wow, nice mullet. Or like even when I had lamb chops, like I remember this lady was in a taxi cab like in her 70s and she just pulled up on the side of me and rolled down the window. She was like, nice chops. And I was like, oh God. It's the, you could probably make some money off of that. Frankie makes money selling his mustache on TikTok. The big booty guy. The green screen zoom guy. You know mm-hmm. what I'm talking about? How does one sell a mustache on TikTok? Um, he grows it, makes a bunch of content about it, shaves it, and then auctions it on eBay. He sold one for three grand. So he like shaves it and puts it on paper and frames it. There's a video. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he makes. There's like a picture of himself shaven. He shaves it really intricately, so like it's not like all a bunch of little clumps, but it's like the individual hairs, and then he glues it back on himself and sells the portrait. I've actually thought about doing that before, but really? there's some logistical issues there. Well, your DNA is just getting passed around to random people? No, I mean, you know, it's got to be long enough and like we, you know, you hold on to a chunk, do you rubber band it and shave that and then put that on there? Like, what's the process look like? He's got a video shave, of it. It's just everywhere. You know? Yeah. You can't really like. And I would want it to be true to the actual beard. You know, I, mm-hmm. I want my chin hair to be on the chin part and, you know, it's. <laughs> yeah. Get everything right. Can't the be lip, bullshit the bottom your lip fake hairs. mustache now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you can't have legit. like sideburns on your upper lip. That's disgusting. <laughs> Who would do that? that? It's just growth. No. Maybe that's why you got to keep it in one. Shave it incrementally. Mustache, beard, and like first you glue your mustache, then you glue your beard, and like do all that other stuff. If that makes sense. Yeah, but then you've got five to ten minutes where you just got like <laughs> just the beard and I shave the just, mustache first, and then keep the beard. Haven't I seen a video? Didn't you make a video where like you shave? everything in it like and yeah in early quarantine goes. like i had a big fat beard and um was working on a little thing about wearing masks and like you should shave to wear your mask properly but then nobody cares about that <laughs> um but yeah i did it, it just like i spin spun around in a chair and shaved a little bit spun around shaved a little bit more spun around and then cut it all together uh morph cut yeah i was about there to say go. morphed in <laughs> yep um love that morph cut oh yeah so Matt is also the head of my security team. He is the drummer in a band, or no, I'm sorry, the keyboardist in a band called Tina in the Sand, badass surf rock band. Um, he has a twin. He's got another twin. He, Hang on, head of your security team? I thought I was head. What? Well, <laughs> when were you head of my security team? <laughs> this all I, I'm also I'm also his manager for his country music career. Yep. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. You know, so, yeah, I do remember that business. You know, he is had. John is the president of Booty Island. That's yeah, true, um, yeah, and yeah. Uh, you know he needed some security, and I was there for him. And that's sort of <laughs> how how I got my way into the role as his manager and creative partner. We were walking okay, through the woods. Okay. Separate uh, business endeavor, obviously. Separate. I realities. wouldn't even think it's a, a business endeavor so much as just a lifestyle and a thing that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. I know I know that he's really good at it because when I was walking through the Nordhaus Dunes as the president, I was very nervous for my safety. And when Matt 
was this pitch black outside when Matt has his ski mask on and I look on the hill and he's already there and I know that the dune is cleared <laughs> and like the trails that I were walking on were cleared and when I would turn around he was behind me and everything was safe I was like he hired the right guy for the head of security I have a rule safety first safety third yeah what's second danger danger <laughs> <laughs> what? danger <laughs> yeah so Matt's funny he's an he's an artist he's a musician he knows a lot about film he's been doing it for a long time um tell us a little bit about what you've been up to lately with either shit. Um, what you, what's what's going on right now with the uh, a2 film fest well it's the week of the ann arbor film fest mm -hmm. what do you do there my favorite week of the year um what do i do there mm -hmm. i i mean I don't really do much at the Phil Fest itself, but I'm a screener, so I like help out through the early processes of kind of moving films from round one to round two, or round two to round three. Yeah, um, they get thousands and thousands and thousands of submissions. Um, so it starts in August. It's usually in the fall, so August through December. I'm watching 20 films every 10 days or so. And get, you're just mar putting X's on them and throwing them off. Well, it graded on a few different categories and giving notes to pass it on to the next round or not. Um, Do you ever just cut people out because they don't make the cut? Is oh that yeah, part of your job? yeah. That's that's yeah. kind of what I'm there for is to Trim you know fat. what what fits in for the festival and you know is it technically good? Is it, there's a lot of different criteria, but there's a lot of films that people submit because it's a qualifier for the Oscars. So if you win best of Ann Arbor Film Fest, you're in contention to win an Oscar. Oh, wow. So I think a lot of people see that and just go ahead and submit to the festival not knowing that the Ann Arbor Film Festival is an experimental festival, mm. first and foremost. Yeah, it's the most, it's the number one avant-garde film festival in the world, right? It's the longest running experimental film fest in North America. Okay, yeah, there we go. For what that's worth. It started yeah. in like... 60s. It's the 60s. I wonder how many other right ones now. there are. Oh, wow. um, so there's a lot of films that I'll view that are really good and I really like them, but they're more of like a Hollywood approach or it's just not right for the festival. So, yeah. you know, I, I try to make it a point to watch all of every film, but if it's 120 minutes long and it's not good and it's going for a Hollywood approach, you know, I can kind of, I maybe won't watch all of those, but. <laughs> Not for um, the twist ending? You know, they most films don't have twist endings. It's it's kind of interesting. Like there's a lot of really shitty films out there. And no. Yeah, no, believe it or not. Um <laughs> How many so, films have you watched this year from the film festival? This year I was a little bit busier in the fall, so I didn't watch as many as in the past, but I probably watched like sixty to eighty. Okay. Varying lengths, you know, anywhere from five minutes to you know, two hours. Okay. Depending. Cool. Matt's also a, a really good filmmaker, specifically in the documentary filmmaking world. I've been working on some do a documentary for a very long time that Matt has helped me scoop back up and kind of sift through. But I think you're really good with things like storytelling, story arcs, what's important, what's not important. Um, even with just these interviews, it was really helpful with you on the editing side because, like, you know, we have hours of interviews that me and Trey are sifting through to have other people to pass things around to and cut fat out from that as well. It's super yeah, good. What's the most important? What's the kernel that needs to get taken out of the big thing? Mm -hmm. We haven't really touched on that everlasting documentary you've been working on too much. Um, John's piece? Intentional or not. But, yeah, the, these two guys sitting right here have been, like, the the workhorses behind that. I mean, you're definitely picking up and helping out when he's needed it and well, I just shaping that story, you know, it's, it's a big story. Sean's a great dude. And like, I've got getting to know him has been really great. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I'm like bought into the doc and his story and I kind of see yeah. how big it is for John. And it's hard for him to sort of separate himself from it sometimes. Yeah. Um, it's definitely difficult to do that, which I've been there. So like, I, you know, I totally understand that. Um, it's like when you get too close to a piece, whether it be an art piece or like a film piece, um, for any reason, uh, your mind gets put in a box and then it's really hard to move forward or backwards or take a step in a separate or a different direction. And I think you really helped me with that too, because the first, the first thing he did when he got Sean's doc is he just deleted all the music and he was like, yeah, this all sucks. This isn't going in here. Like this is totally putting everything. This is driving the piece in like a way that's not where it needs to be. You're like, well, what? the music is definitely going to help 
it's your roadmap, if you will, or like setting the tone of your piece. So like yeah. you have a jamming song, then your edit and your like the way you're going to tell your story is going to be completely different as opposed to if it was like some super mellow, whatever at times, like it, it's yeah. going to change how you tell that story for sure. And I think the story has changed too. Like when you first started, it was just going to kind of be a, a promo piece yeah. in, in a way. And so I think the music that you had initially was great for that, you, yep. you know, like, like the drop highlight reel type of thing. But mm-hmm. as it's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, it's gotten a little heavier and you oh, know, yeah. there's the promo aspect to it, but it needs, it needed more ebb. I mean, because we filmed that, that yeah. chef's table thing with him. Fucking years, like 2018 like or something. four years, three, four years. It's over that. It's five years. Five years? It's been five years. Wow. That project file was started in 2018. Whew. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, and when I started it, it was more of like a, fun, a fun promo piece. And I was like, hell yeah. Like It's also great for us to get like demo reel material and spec work style stuff. But then we just kept filming and filming and filming and filming and filming. Like every event. And we had like every camera. Like you... I've been a workhorse on it. Matt's been a workhorse on it, but you don't sell yourself short as well. Cause like you have just as many gigs in footage for that doc, um, since the beginning. So yeah, it's fun. I really hope it has a, a happy ending with it. You know, time will tell. We'll be able to figure that out. And I think that's the challenging thing is the story has evolved and it keeps changing. So, you know, yeah. kind of where it's at right now, like there's no end to this. So, mm-hmm. you know, working on it lately it's trying to get it to that point like up till the now and then mm-hmm. it could go a couple of different ways and you know hopefully the, the better way and it's yeah and it's one of those stories that's so big and it's been shot well enough and like with the expertise that we have between like everybody who's been working on it like it could be almost like a career changing doc if um it works out in the way that ideally in the best case scenario would but who knows that's why i just wanted to keep going with it so yeah there's some things that haven't been touched on yet that I think are really, really important. And, uh, yeah, gotta, we have a couple more that. interviews. We'll to talk do. about that. Do you want to yeah. lay down like the, the log line for the viewers on like what this piece that you're working on is in case they don't know? Um, yeah. I mean, one of my best friends, um, Sean Marshall is a chef and actually I've wanted to get him on this podcast, but we just haven't done it. Um, he is a very high skilled chef and, the more you get to know him, the more you realize how like insanely driven he is by certain aspects of life, whether it be like pride or passion or like your gut or whatever the hell you want to do. But the thing is, is that he's a diabetic and he's put a lot of things to the wayside when he's like trying to achieve this chef stardom. And because of that, um, plenty time and time again, life threatening scenarios have popped up that, <clears throat> basically thre- yeah, threaten his life. So, so basically successful and very talented chef is battling health issues and yeah, it's needs like, to overcome such. Yeah, it's like his drive is what makes him a good chef and makes him successful at things, but it's also the thing that's killing him that's detrimental to his health. So, you know, there is this internal battle that I think he's struggling with of like, how to find success in that chef world, but also success in the health front and staying yeah. alive and being able to be successful in the chef world. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's basically like every episode is chef's table. Cause I mean like Grant Adkins, no, not Grant Adkins. What the hell am I talking about? Well, who's the guy who, who lost his taste buds? Wolf's mouth, dude. Not that guy. There's a, okay. So there's a bunch of chef's table episodes where it's strictly about like a chef with a health issue. Like one of them, there was a guy who like basically blew out his stress receptors in his brain and like lost his vision and like all these sorts of crazy shit was happening to him. And he had to do the same thing and step back because like his whole nervous system was shutting down. And like there was another guy who had tongue cancer and like couldn't taste anymore. So like as a chef, he was losing the ability to taste. So like there's these crazy like things it's universal like it's not just chefs but i think you know chefing is such an intense thing if you're doing Mm -hmm. it well it's really it really takes a toll on your body but i've experienced the same things even with filmmaking or music or ultimate or any of the things that i've done for long periods of time they say find what you love and let it kill you but i don't think they literally meant it like that Adobe's um, getting damn close. <laughs> <laughs> um, so another thing, you just mentioned Ultimate. Matt, you're a world champion Ultimate player. What is it? He's going for that world championship. Uh, tell well, us tell us your I, goals with this beach. Tell us what you've done and, and end it with that beautiful scenery that you described to me. 
Let me just sum it all up. Yeah, and, do it. Um, <laughs> fuck. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I started playing Ultimate Frisbee in college yeah. at University of Michigan. Um, never really heard of it before, but I had played sports growing up, and it like I was into it and started traveling around and. Apparently I was pretty good and just kind of stuck with it. And yeah, it's, I've chased plastic all over the world. Um, <laughs> so as you call it the desk there. chasing plastic, chasing plastic. Yeah. Um, and that's really what I do. You know, I mean, I, everybody's a thrower, everybody's a receiver, but I'm more of a receiver. So I just tell people to throw it, keep it in balance and I just go run it down. So I feel like a dog sometimes, just playing catch. <laughs> you're like six simplest. foot five. But you're self, playing on like across the field. you're playing on like the like world United you're States. You're like team. world, yeah, like the USA team, right? Yeah, back in 2011, I applied and got selected for uh, Team USA for the Beach World Championships in Italy, and we went and we won gold there. And then um, I play on a team in Minneapolis, and we we won a few national championships in like. 11, 12, and 13. And then I was on the Beach Worlds team again. Uh, in 2015, we went to Dubai. And what? You've been to Dubai? Once, yeah. I don't, there's no need to go back. Yeah. It's, <laughs> Dubai is weird. It's like a mix between Vegas and Disneyland. <laughs> That's like, kind of what I always thought. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, that was a great experience. And I mean, being making Team USA kind of... I mean, USA is the best team in the world. Like we've got, there's more ultimate players here in the U.S. than anywhere else. So, winning gold was kind of an expectation. Um, but this club team I play on out of Minneapolis, we've won a few national championships. I've been to Worlds with them three times as the number one seed, and we've never won. Mm. So, Australia in 2020, we were going and COVID. That that was our year. We had a strong team. I was feeling good. I remember, like after qualifying for it, I, I thought in my mind, there, "There's nothing that's stopping us this time." Oh man! Yeah. Wah, wah, wah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Shouldn't have thought about that. <laughs> it's um, all your fault. COVID is your fault because of that. So this summer, the we qualified for Ireland, which is the World Championships. So, are you still first seed? Uh, we will not be the first seed. We we took second place at nationals last year. So okay. team from Colorado will be seated above us. So. We'll see. I'm slightly injured. You know, I'm working. I'm not getting any younger here. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm dealing with some back issues, some heel issues. Uh, but, I mean, Ultimate, Ultimate's kind of the reason I got into photography in some way, just because it. I, I started traveling the world because of it. Um, got a camera for some of my travels, and one of my favorite things to do would just be get lost in a city and travel around, like just walk around with my little Sony Alpha it's like mm-hmm. the NEX5 I think I had. Nice, yeah. Um, and I just put it in manual mode and kind of taught it. myself what everything does and just took thousands and thousands of pictures. So like really kind of honed my eye, um, just getting lost and seeing things in cities that I, you know, trying to learn what the camera would see. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting. I used to have super bad travel anxiety and one of the things that helped me get over it was like looking through my camera. Because like if I see it through my camera, it's not that scary. But I don't know how that works. It is a bit of a crutch. Like, even for live shows and stuff. It gives I, you something to do. Yeah. I, I like shooting live shows because I have this thing that I can kind of hide behind. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Being able to be yeah. in the pit with, like, a bunch of people around you. And then, like, everybody still kind of doesn't touch you because you're the cameraman. And they just respect just, your space. Just a don't little. make eye contact. Just look right into the, yeah. mm-hmm. into the viewfinder. <laughs> That's what I do. I'll, like, if I'm trying to move, like through the crowd like just be in your camera and people will just like part the seas for you <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i like to have my tripod up on a like just a little higher on my shoulder and like kind of lean it forward a little bit so people in the corner of their eyes can just see this camera looming over their head and i'm just like oh that's the sign to get well, the fuck sh- out of my way i've been just carrying around a strobe flashlight too on the like f- shining it at the ground i'm not blasting people in the face with it but just doing that people will move like like wildfire. I mean, they think it's security and stuff. So yeah, I went to a a ween show at Royal Oak music theater week ago or so. It's a great show, but I noticed there were a handful of people that just had those little flashlights and I I thought it was security too. And you just get out of the way. And then I realized it was just some girl that was trying to get up to the front. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Like I'm smart. I actually never thought about that. That's pretty genius. Yeah. I think it's the way to do it. Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, concert life hack. Been doing a couple shows lately and that's definitely a, 
a key. Are you getting stoked for summer, man? Mercive just got to E4. What's up with that? Mm, yep. Electric Forest, a couple artists that we work with are on that lineup, so should be pretty pretty nice. bonkers. They gave me hella dates, too. We're still trying to figure out where, where and what we're going for, so should be fun, but a lot of shows, a lot of, a lot of shows. Show life. Tell me a little bit about, um, and the viewers, I mean, I obviously know a little bit, but uh, what are these TVs that you supposedly grow? <laughs> Yeah, the TV garden. It sounds like you're talking about my TV garden. Oh, oh, is that what it's called? Yeah, so it's, it, <laughs> it was my brother's idea, uh, Shoot Van Barber. Okay. Um, yeah. Where has he been at, by the way? He's been out in Arizona. He's, He's just, just clean and shit? Yeah, pre-COVID, he went out there. He was uh, getting back into like the Van Barber shit. Okay. Like <laughs> literally traveling around in his van cutting hairs. Um, <laughs> what? That's why he, I mean, he changed his name. That's not his real name. Um like so when he ran away from home went out to Arizona he was a freelance barber for a little while and what i thought he just vacuumed i thought he was just a cleaner well so he got into some trouble cuz you know the like the old floby like the haircutting thing it's like basically a vacuum yeah that yeah sucks the vacuum that up. sucks and cuts it <laughs> he he was trying to like make his own versions of that and uh he was doing a demonstration on this kid and basically ripped this kid's scalp off what um and ended up getting blacklisted from the barber community in Arizona um just in Arizona though well and it's Barbers don't really communicate. I was about to say. Word like, only gets so far. Right. So that's when he got in his van and just started traveling around um, trying yeah. to sell this thing. It wasn't going very well. Um, he got into, I mean, he's always been into guns, but like shooting stuff and just living in his van, traveling around, trying to cut hair. Uh, <laughs> traveling think, across state lines with illegal flobies and possibly and, illegal guns. And I think that's when, that's around the time that he decided to change his name because everybody else knew David and like, you know, mm. David was kind of blacklisted but nobody knew who shoot van barber was so it just sort of represented who he was at that time and he's kind of just dug into it since then he likes to shoot and he lives in a van and he's a barber boom boom yeah like, it's a little bit on the nose bro but hey whatever yeah um, so so okay so he was visiting me a few years back and he's had this crazy idea he calls it like bioelectric engineering or something um so he would like, he would bury like VCRs and TVs or like parts of them um, in an attempt to like grow combo TV VCRs. Yeah, and like it, a hybrid mix <clears throat> between. So you have like the VCR attached to the TV kind of thing. No, was yeah. this? Yeah. Where did he do this? Was this natural in pots? Was this in like some sort of plot of land or what? This is in my front yard. Okay, it's kind of my side yard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's kind of it's kind of weird, but um, you can see it a little bit. And a little. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how it happened. I'm pretty. I think that he just went and found some other TVs and like placed them out there when I wasn't looking one day. But sure enough, some combo TV showed up. VCRs were there. Um, wow. Did they grow like bigger, or were they just kind of like boom? Well, some they're of them one and done. Kind of growth. I've seen some... growth spurt. There's a small one and there's a big one. Um, oh, okay. And then like... he came back and harvested them like a year later. Yeah. Um, Didn't somebody else try to rip them out? Well, you know, one of my neighbors was coming around, kind of letting me know that Big George's takes TVs back. Uh, like, yeah. Hey, man, just let you know, the TV is in your yard. You can sell them somewhere. He's like, you heard of Big George's? Yeah. You know, they take TVs. Yeah, cool, bro. What the, what's your point? And he then, didn't get the whole premise of that those were actually growing, though. He thought that those were just literal junk that you were throwing into your side yard. Yeah, I don't know what he thought. We, Which we is kind of offensive in Shoot Van Barber's problem. Well, we don't necessarily see eye to eye, this neighbor in me anyways. Um, so there's this long, awkward silence, and he looked over and he was like, yeah, because, you know, you've got these TVs in your yard. I was like, well, that's, that's my television garden. And he was really kind of confused. Um, there, what was like, the look on his face when you said that? I, he took like a step back, and I think his eyes crossed and his head cocked <laughs> to the side just a little bit. Did the vein on his um, forehead show up a little bit? It, a little glitch. That, that was the moment where I was like, shoot is a genius, and this art project, this is the culmination of everything. It's working. 
we haven't, he hasn't actually spoken to me since that day. Oh, really? <laughs> really? Like he's, he's Even always, throughout the whole entire thing? He's always walking his dog and his dog just likes to sit outside my house and look at my house. So I see him a lot. And like, I'll walk out my front door and he's just standing there looking at my house. And as soon as I walk out, it's head down and he just walks away. Like he won't make eye contact with me. You're like, he doesn't uh, wave. have you ever seen the movie, The Burbs? Yeah. You're like the doctor in The Burbs. It's the weirdest thing, but. I'm kind of okay with it because he's a dick and yeah. he's been a dick to me the whole time that I've lived there. So, um, it's all right. I, I'm okay with where we're at now. It's, it's kind of the relationship I'd like to have with him. So, but then what happened when they tried <laughs> to rip the TVs out? Do you want to talk about that? <clears throat> well, I didn't have a deck. I think the viewers would love to hear this story. So I didn't have a deck for a little while and I think that's sort of where it started. And I think this neighbor called the city on me that, and this inspector showed up and told me that I didn't have a permit for my construction site. And I informed him that it wasn't a construction site. It had, just, it had been like that for over a year. Um, and he sort of agreed with me. Um, this is speaking onto your porch or your... My porch. Okay. This is my porch. This, yeah. this is totally separate. Mm -hmm. um, so I had some conversations with him. And I actually went and visited my mom for a, like a long weekend in North Carolina. And when I came back... I had a notice on my front door. It was like a 24 hour notice to remove garbage from my yard. And next to that was a ticket because I was gone for a long weekend. So I didn't even see the 24 hour notice. Um, yeah. And so the city gave me, city of Ann Arbor gave me a ticket for having refuse in my yard. How much does that ticket cost? If you don't mind me asking. I think it was like 280 bucks. Jeez. Something like that, which <clears throat> whatever, you Yeah, know, whatever. it's, it's not going to make or break me, but that's kind of a pain in the ass. But I went and I looked in my front yard and I didn't see any refuse. Like there, there's no garbage. In what were you looking garden. at? Well, I was looking at art. And so the I went. Garden. The TV garden. Yeah, there's the TV garden. And so I, I looked up the city code and I like, I'm my own lawyer as well as your head of security and yeah. everything else. Like I, I dabble in a lot of different mm -hmm. things. Um, but reading the code, I could see that clearly there was a misunderstanding here. Yeah. Um, so. I challenged it, and, and you're able to have an informal hearing before going in front of an actual judge. So I was like, yeah, let's do that. Um, turns out Ann Arbor only has one magistrate, and that magistrate is my neighbor. Ooh. <laughs> Sounds like a conflict of interest. Yeah, so she recused herself, and in as she was saying why she would recuse herself, I started questioning if it was actually this other neighbor that had called the cops, or if she was a part of it as well. So... Um, and you still haven't talked to the neighborhood force ganging up to take down the TV garden. Yeah, they they just I don't know. They, they probably have a group text about it. Facebook group, all the moms in the neighborhood. I I'm not on next door like that yeah. app, but I've like wanted to just to see like. I was on next door one time and it was so stupid. I was like, this is dumb. Is that just and I just deleted like it. a chat for your area? Exactly, okay. it's like your neighborhood chat. It's basically where people bitch about stuff all the time, right? Susie didn't take out her trash, and now exactly. it's piling up. Can we take care of that? So the, the magistrate recused herself. And the pain in the ass for this was I was actually on, I was working out in California. I was doing shooting some stuff with Leon for, for P-Rod. And I was supposed to be on site at 9 a.m., but 9 a.m. was when my hearing was. So I had to sit at the Airbnb, and then I sat there for two hours just to find on out Zoom? it was my neighbor. And she recused oh. herself. Yeah, this is all Zoom court, which... Yeah. Um, I, they, you're not, you're not allowed to record any of these proceedings, but if you're doing a documentary on something, like, I, I don't know how you're going to document these things without recording it. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like also the fact that it's like, you know, you're, you're filming so much stuff for your documentaries. You should just write everything off cause for your documentaries, you know, film yourself going to the grocery store. Maybe, <laughs> <laughs> but so that it was more of like I just wanted to like capture this moment because the the document or the documentary in my head was Ann Arbor the working title was Ann Arbor wouldn't know art if it was in my front yard, mm. um, and so when the magistrate ended up being my neighbor that was this it just kind of blew my mind now it's like there's a conspiracy against me and <laughs> my television garden yeah um, I thought it was Shoots Television Garden well, well it's, yours it's now. mine now yeah. I mean it's on my my land. It's, mm -hmm. I credit him for the vision of it, uh, but he hasn't been around, so yeah. somebody's got to tend to it. Okay. So I eventually had an actual hearing in front of a judge, um, and uh, 
the prosecutor for Ann Arbor, you know, this is again on Zoom. She was a little bit confused why I was even there. And the community standards officer who had written me the ticket was trying to explain all these things. Um, but I just kind of stepped in and explained what the situation was. Long story short, she said that I'm, uh, I'm working for the greater good of society and that my art can stay. Ooh, so, case through that closed. Out. And so I eventually get in front of the judge and the prosecuting attorney basically says all these things and the judge is also confused and she's like, well, Mr. Wilkin, congratulations. Like, your, your tenacity has paid off. This doesn't usually happen, but you're off the hook. And you're like, yeah, because it's a fucking TV garden. Yeah. It's not trash. Interesting enough, during that period of time, I was working on a project where I got to interview Tyree Guyton. Who's that? He's the guy who started the Heidelberg Project. Okay, in yeah. Detroit. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like kind of brought up this litigation that I was having with him. And I was like, it sounds like you've run into some similar things. And he was actually thrown in jail by the city of Detroit. For the Heidelberg Project? For the trash that he had there. And he wow. he fought it for years and years and years. And actually, our arguments were basically the same. Um, but he got in front of a judge and the officer and you know explained that when it comes to the law, that those guys are the experts. But when it comes to art, you know he's got an honorary degree from CCS. He had a gallery in Sweden, a gallery in New York City. He's like, if anybody knows what art is, it's me. Not you. Right, and <laughs> the judge and the officer are like, well, basically agreed I don't with know him art. and threw it out. And they're like, well, I, I guess if you think this is art, gotcha. you're a famous artist. Sure. So that's how he won that case and got to continue with the Heidelberg Project, which I think is kind of winding down. I think he's been scaling it back a little bit. You know, I've so. never been to the Heidelberg Project. I really? biked, I biked through it one time on a slow roll way back in the day, and I've driven past it, but like I've never explored it because I know you can like it's a big bunch of lots right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's really interesting yeah i've never never been there i want to um well where did where did this tv garden go what did it expand into what's going on right now with this film fest what have you been doing well these are kind of i guess parallel projects um none of does it have anything to do with bio electric bioelectric engineering no 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 Um, okay it was like the tv garden is an inspiration and you know i always kind of start there when i'm thinking about projects that I want to do and how I might be able to incorporate it. Um, but this one was supposed to be, it was going to be nine televisions stacked on top of each other, powered by VCRs. And it was initially going to be an interactive performance. Um, so Herm and I, Jeremy Leeson, we've been collaborating on things for a little while and it's part his brainchild, part my brainchild. We've been talking about this thing for a little while. And so the Ann Arbor Film Fest does off the screen which is a series of installations around town leading up to the fest and during the fest. And so we wrote a proposal for it um, for a bunch of televisions powered by VCRs with this musical performance. And then we were going to like basically get inside of the televisions and then run around in them and then come out. Um, And it got accepted. But then the space that they gave us was only 13 inches deep by like 70 (laughs) wide and 75 (laughs) tall. I was like, you, Doesn't do a lot. I was like, you guys didn't read the proposal, did you? <laughs> <laughs> um, but they accepted it and gave us this space, the aquarium gallery at the yeah. Ann Arbor Art Center, um, which is which across is right up. Yeah, it's across from Fleetwood Cosmos um, on the corner of Liberty and Ashley. I was just down there last week and I didn't look at it. What, dude? I'm a terrible person. It, during the day, it's hard to see. Yeah. Um, so w- we ended up adapting it to be nine computer monitors. Um, that we kind of built into a big stack, and it's like one giant screen with nine made of nine small screens. Yeah, nine different models of older computer monitors. Um, so it's yeah, it's got a little bit of a, an aesthetic, like sculptural thing going on, and that's powered by nine different media players. So we ended up what we ended up doing was exporting nine different videos. So they're not actually synced up. But they're all the same length. It's the same player. So on repeat, it's it stays pretty close. But it's a half-hour loop. So every half hour, it gets off just a By little a bit. By a second. Um, and so over the course, it's been up for almost a month now. <clears throat> and we've reset it a couple of times. But leaving it for a few days, it kind of has morphed into its own, own little, thing. little thing. And um, It's growing it's in the garden. Cool. Yeah, it's, it's organic. It's um, it, So it does embody that sort of... Kind of like what we were talking about with the delay, like when you point a camera at a TV that you have 
hooked up to the inputs and stuff. Kind mm-hmm. of that same sort of thing, right? Like yeah. Eventually bounces and grows into mm-hmm. something organic and unexpected. Yeah. Happy accidents. Well, also, That's rad. from what I've seen, it's on Instagram. It's inside, outside the box. Inside the box, outside the box. Yeah. So all, any, all one word. Yeah. Anybody who's listening, go check it out on Instagram. It's a really dope um, project they've been working on. But um, it's covered in like leaves and stuff too. So it's like got this nature aspect of like these vines hanging down over these TVs. So it's kind of like, it really reminds me of the TV garden. just kind of like this yin and yang between like nature and technology, especially when it's like outdated technology. Exactly. So it's like, yeah, technology, nature, cities, um, and just kind of, you know, inside and outside these dualities and really like we're a kind of our own box, like we're a meat suit. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> how do, how do we get outside of our meat suits? How do we get outside of our own minds and, yeah. or how do we get into technology, you know? And cause sometimes when I'm editing, like I feel like I'm becoming part of my computer and if I'm there for too long, like I have to, I have to work to kind of get outside of that box or sometimes work to get back into it, you know, like a nice eight hour edit by that, by that second hour, you're in it and you're part of it. And sometimes it takes a little bit of time to get back into that mindset. So there, these were all just kind of I guess, inspirational flows. thoughts that we had when we were making this project. Um, it's really cool too, because you got like Jeremy in the green man suit keyed out, like basically it's just this man in this float, like floating around in this reality as like this entity of technology kind of that's what it reminds me of when we're planning on doing more with it. So this is kind of, it forced us to make a thing, but we still want to do the television aspect. Um, and I've talked to some people, I think we're getting it placed. We might put it somewhere in the Nichols arcade afterwards. What happened? You, yeah, right. As you made it, somebody hit up the Instagram, like a business owner <clears throat> and was like, Hey, can I buy one? And you're like, oh, yeah, what, yeah, yeah. how much? 20 grand. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I, yeah, I mean, right out the gate, this guy was like, I want one of these. How can I get one of these for my storefront window? So then we're you're like, oh, so you're a business. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we're, arti- we're artists. <laughs> That's the dream. Get paid to like do the weird shit that I love doing. This um, is the town to do it. But I, I've since talked to this guy. Uh, his, his name's Jack. He owns the 911 iPhone repair shop in Nichols Arcade. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that guy. Uh, he's, like, he's a pretty cool guy. I think he's like kind of trying to do an art gallery in his space. So I don't think. I don't think we're going to make any money off it. We're actually not even trying to, but I think we're going to try to work with him, do something, whether it's digital signage, create a whole art show, or... I don't see... uh, That jewelry store right next to it has some really cool art in it, too. My mom used to work at the university flower shop, so, like, she knew all those people, but the jewelry shop had, like, some really cool bugs that I was intrigued with. But what were you going to say? I just don't see why that can't be, like, at a super fancy, like, new age like modern bar, you know what I mean? And then you just look at the wall and it's that TV installation. It could. With the I've, trippy. I've seen some of those before. I yeah. Like you need to just pitch that in out. In Amsterdam, I've seen some of that stuff or like old school Nam June Pike. Like there's a lot of people that have yeah. done similar aesthetics. So it's 10 grand, new, but 10 grand. Leland be Club. Worth it? Have you guys ever been there in Detroit? No. It's this like after hours bar and they just have like this installment with just straight porn playing. It's kind of. That's dope. Nice. It was a weird, weird place. <laughs> just, I'm probably not going to go back. You take like somebody on like the third date to this bar with porn playing. And you're like like hey, four in the morning. What the, You want to go back to my place and hang out? <laughs> After they've just been viewing porn for like, like two hours right and here. drinking <laughs> alcohol. Um, that brings me to a th- thing. A surprise? Da, 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 da. Oh, oh, oh. Are you guys actually going to cut me a check? (laughs) 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 Oh, wow. It's um, a fully grown Panasonic tube TV. And and albino Panasonic. These are hard to find. Albino, yeah. Sun bleached, actually. (sighs) Yeah, so... This is sexy. There's a little story behind this TV here. For all of our viewers, you might have to flip over to YouTube to take a gander at this beautiful specimen here. Um, So my friend was growing it in his apartment. LED light. I'm going to plug it in for you. Hydroponic. He said, what kind of inputs have grown on this bad boy? Yeah. And so my buddy was moving. 1996. Shout out. Yeah. Shout out Jake D. 
he was moving to New York and he had all this old shit. And instead of throwing it all out when he, Devin, who's downstairs currently leveling up my character in Elden Ring, hell yeah. Um, he <laughs> gave, he sold Fuck him. yeah, bro. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting up there, dude. So um, he moved to New York, sold Devin a car. Oh, listen to that feedback coming through. Whoa. That Whoa. I wonder We're if the viewers will be able to hear that. Zapped through these. Yeah, it's cool, man. I've seen that TV in action with a delayed camera, like in, at a live show, like with it. Like there's a camera in a bush, and everybody's trying to find the camera, but they can't, and they can just see themselves on TV looking at this bush. And you're like, what the hell's going on? But yeah, so then when he sold Devin the car, he was like, "You can get the car, and I'm giving it to you for like eight grand off because <laughs> he sold it to him for like three grand, but it should have been like a lot more because they're just homies." And he's like, "Um, you just have to keep everything that's inside the car." Cause I don't want to have to deal with it. So anything that they, he didn't want, I assume he just threw just in this car. Up car. Yeah. Loaded up this car. So then Devin came over and we had to do like a dumpster run. <laughs> like we, we want to keep this, keep this. No, throw that out. Like, Oh, we got like 30 mugs, a couple thermoses and in the trunk underneath a few skateboards, um, actually fully complete decks, which is interesting. Mm. There is this TV and I, I know you hit me up and you're like, do you want this TV? And he said, fuck yeah. The answer is always yes. Yeah. So like, you know, that's, it works. I know it wow. specifically was for Super Smash Bros and skate videos, but it goes. Panasonic Color TV, March 1996. Ooh. I bet that you this bad boy at the time was like 200 bucks. Maybe even more. Trying yeah, to see an actual date on that, there. This is just it only sticker. has coax and RCA inputs. It doesn't even have the uh, that dates it. Well, it doesn't have anything on the front. No. Um, it looks like it's got like a headphone out. <laughs> no VCR attached. It. You might have to plant it and get a VCR growing in it. It says licensed under one or the fo- one or more of the following patents, and there's like ten of them. <laughs> well, I, I have no. Covers out of them. I have no lack of adapters. So, yeah, so you should be I good. I can go from HDMI to RCA to coax to just the plugs and everything kind of in between. So, yeah, that's yours now. Awesome. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks Congratulations. Guys. Happy birthday. Yeah, you guys don't need to cut me a check anymore. Oh, no, sweet. Yeah. Yeah, bro, we're about good. to call you every time. <laughs> we, yo, Let's who's got TVs, bro? Kiwanis real quick and load up on Matt Wilkin payments. Um, I gotta, <laughs> let's take a break real quick. I got a 10 1. I think it's a good time to just stop the segment for a second. Uh, dun, 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 dun. And we're back. Welcome to Noise Music with Matt. Hope this doesn't blow out your car speakers if you're listening to this in your car or headphones. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's really cool how you have everything going up with that installation. Tonight I'm going to the A2 Film Fest animation segment, which is going to be cool. By the time I think our viewers hear this, it's going to be a couple weeks from now. So A couple weeks or... Yeah, there's some promotion stuff that I want to do. We've dropped a lot of podcasts on Spotify, but the numbers haven't reached anything in comparison to when we like promote them on Instagram and go through like that. So I just want to cut a couple videos up and do some stuff. Maybe you need to be a little edgier. <clears throat> a little edgier. Say some shit that pisses some people off. Yeah, I don't know. I listen to a lot of celebrity podcasts, and they have no filter. And I'm like, man, only if I was super rich. Right. <laughs> like when I could learn, like, like be okay with burning a few. Uh, you also kind of got to be a dick to believe connections. Some of that shit. What? Yeah, that's valid. I don't know. I don't really think you guys are dicks. <laughs> you might say some inflammatory shit sometimes. Like, I like to push buttons, but whatever. I don't say inflammatory stuff. You're a ridiculous human, Sean. Yeah, Matt, you're a ridiculous human. He was calling me a ridiculous human, and then it was a couple days later, it dawned on me. I was like, wait, I'm not ridiculous. Matt is way more ridiculous than I am. He was just passing it off from him to me, like put the attention on me. I think we're all just bags of meat. Yeah. In the meat bag. Um, but yeah, so what's what else is going on? What else is new? What have you been up to? I know you went to some crazy gathering recently. Did I? Yeah, your schedule is insane. I don't know. This man does not sleep, ladies and gentlemen. No, not at all. It doesn't work. Like I don't understand. We got. We took a what? What was that? We got in at like what time? We got in at like nine a.m. We had a four six a.m. flight out of out of Georgia, and then I see this man on his stories like 
still like at a venue like shooting or something that night and i'm like what the hell are you doing <laughs> yeah opportunities when they present themselves you know you got to take advantage of them when you can it's like so right before it. we went to georgia i remember calling you it was like you know 3 p.m day before we leave we leave the next morning at like 4 a.m and i was like yeah what's up like you want to have a time we can sit down and talk about some of this stuff and you were just like the gears were turning so fast, the steam's coming out, and you're like, I'm installing this project. I haven't eaten anything. Like, I don't really know. I can't talk to you about this shit right now. <laughs> it's like, boop. Well, just yeah, hangs but, up the phone. I was like, inside the box, mm. outside the box project. We had just, we had been burning it for like two days. And they only gave to you a the certain export out. And oh, yeah. I imagine the export was a nightmare. Yeah, it was, it was huge. And the workflow was a little, yeah, we should have given ourselves a couple more weeks, but you know, nothing like a deadline. How do you make, how do you, <laughs> A couple more weeks, and then you're like, yeah, we did it in a day. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that, as a time traveler, too. sometimes yeah. there you just can't sleep. Yeah. Jeez. I love sleeping, though. I can sleep for 14 hours at a time, if given the chance. I well, used to say I'll sleep when I'm dead, but now I realize that I'd like sleep a lot. Weren't you saying, you've told me before that you, you mastered like not sleeping and just taking like short naps during a, a period of your time of your life? The, yeah. <laughs> the, what is it? It's Einstein and Edison effect is what they call it. Yeah. I forget one of, it was Einstein. And one Edison. of those guys was well, some inventor. I, I heard the story years ago where he would like, as the story goes, he would sit underneath a tree with a big metal bowl in his lap and he would put a spoon in his mouth and uh as soon and he would kind of meditate and like you know slow down his heart rate and his breathing and kind of get to that restful state and as soon as he got there like the spoon would fall out and it would clank in the big metal bowl and that would wake him up and then he knew that he had rejuvenated himself enough to get back to whatever he was doing there is some power in the 20 minute naps the power nap the cat nap there's yeah have you put a spoon in your mouth with a bowl before? I've, I've never done that. No, that seems kind of. I would. I would like to test that out. That we kind of. I feel nice. like I would be. I, I would just, just don't like putting metal in my. I mouth. I would just be thinking about this. Why do I have this spoon in my <laughs> mouth? And like, I don't know. Yeah, we have a we have alarms and stuff nowadays. It's right. a little outdated. Um, <laughs> it reminds me. There reminds me. Tiller Russell is that the guy? No, 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 no. Who was the other documentary maker who made the sat the Sasquatch thing that we were talking about? Who was that I guy? I don't remember who that was. Sasquatch on the weed farms? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, What's his can't name? Remember his name. I'm Googling it right now. But sleep is really important. Like without sleep, we don't function. Um, but so playing Ultimate in college, there was a, a year and a half where I kept a diary of every everything that I ate, everything that I put into my body, how much sleep I got, how much water I drank, the workouts that I did the competitions I was a part of and then like kind of how I felt in all of those. And that, that year and a half, like I really figured out my own body and like what foods work well for me. And I could look back at trends. So if I would go to a competition and do really well, I would want to kind of emulate that for the next time. Or if I did really poorly, I could look back and see what were the trends that kind of got me to, That's to where I level was. Athlete shit right there. Well, or just like athlete taking, or care, anything. taking like, care of your body. Yeah. Really kind of learning what works for me. And the main takeaway that I got was as long as, <clears throat> as long as I drank enough water. Yeah. You've told me this. As and, long as you're hydrated, you can do anything. <laughs> <laughs> kind of. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> just live off the, what, there's like breath areas that just live oh, off yeah. the energy of the earth. <laughs> yeah. that, that's a little crazy to me, but I think that there is something to be said for just like, there's energy in the world, and you know you can tap into it to some degree. But. So, breath what? Aryans hang out really quick. <laughs> okay, what is this? This is like the TikTokers are like. It's like a vet, like a vegetarian, like vegans, but breath Aryans. They don't consume vegetables. They don't consume meat. They don't consume anything but air. <laughs> That's <laughs> fucking stupid. I don't totally buy it. No, of course not. There was he. Who, there is somebody that I'm not going to name, but <laughs> they posted an Instagram story, and they were like starting my 40 day fast with no food or water. And then my buddy screenshotted it and sent it to me. And he's like, all right, I guess he's just going to die. <laughs> <laughs> we were just like, dude, what are you doing? Like, that's not going to work. But mind over body, it, like it's super possible. And I think that's kind of what I work off of a lot is, you know, when opportunities arise, like 
you got to take advantage of them when they're there and you can sleep later, you know, to the detriment of my health sometimes, I think. But there is this, there is a way to kind of tap into higher parts of yourself to be able to push through when you need to. So mind over body to me, I think is like, I don't buy it. Well, you take five shits a day. Like you're very <laughs> yes. much body. A healthy person <laughs> takes three to five shits a day. It's true. They do. And I don't understand how so you guys are saying don't we're eat. not healthy. Bro, are you coming at me? <laughs> I eat okay. my vegetables. So okay. let's just say when we, were at this, only. when we were at this shoot in Georgia, there these guys don't eat breakfast. They drink coffee and they, don't, they at lunch they eat something I like a banana. Yeah, okay, I get it. That, that is breakfast. Yeah, but usually you say you don't eat breakfast. I know for a fact Trey does not eat until like two or like three or one, like nothing at all. And it, like, I think, you know, breakfast is the most important part of the day. Like you got to wake up and then you got to eat some food, get that metabolism going, get that high energy. Yeah, like, you're very much body. Yeah, I'm super body oriented and some people call it high maintenance. And it's, I mean, it is what it is because that's what helps my mind operate at the level that I have to. Um, and that's through just like well, a I mean, lot of energy and food. You start your morning off with an espresso or two. The caffeine from the espresso drives you right to the computer, so you start cranking. The also the espresso just pauses your metabolism or whatever the fuck it does, so you're not hungry. Two p.m. rolls around, you can have yourself a little snack. Look at how much work you got. Six. If I wake up, mosey around, eat breakfast, then I'm like, Ugh, I got food in my stomach. Then I'm hungry in like two more hours. Well, maybe they, getting to work. It's well, just six like seven pauses. p.m. rolls around, and then I it's always the classic. I like I'll call or text Trey, and then I'll get a text from Dina, and she'll be like, "He's sleeping. He has a headache." And I'm like, "Oh, that's like a, that's staring. like a one once a month." No, it's rants. not. It's like once every week. No way. I do not have that many head headaches. Oh, well, then it's just but, like, oh, this, this happens when you don't eat food. You stare at a computer screen and drink espresso all day. I think it can help you deal with adversity too. Like, but if you don't eat a lot and then you get into a bad mood, like how do you? how do you stay headstrong through all of that? And it's like a bit of a meditation for me in a sense. And that's like how Trey's body re like I, that's how Trey's mind operates at the fullest because I don't think you're not operating at your fullest for sure. But like I do, I do take into account how unhealthy that is and not eating with that. And then like eating later at night or whatever that case may be. Like I need to get that on track. But like what you're saying with like writing everything down and really figuring out what, what works for your body and stuff like that's been something I've been wanting to do for a while and just get more of a, a health regimen down. I've been drinking smoothies in the morning. You'd be proud of me. Hell we'll yeah. A little bit more smoothie action to kind of get that going Yeah, alongside my coffee, of course, but I'm in a of course I'm at a oatmeal in the morning right now with like protein powder and, and protein milk. Do you do like the packs or is it like the Quaker plain? Oatmeal? No, the Quaker plain, but I do cold, cold oats. So like or quick oats, or whatever they call it. So like I make on Sunday, three to five mason jars with a cup of oatmeal and then a cup of milk and a cup of protein powder and then you let it sit in your fridge and then the oats absorb everything and I usually will put a dash of vanilla in there, maybe a little bit of sugar or something and then um, come morning, you know, I just microwave that mason jar and eat right out of it and the with oatmeal the is already there. Yeah, with the lid on. <laughs> but yeah, so then, then, I, then I hop from that and then around two or three I eat a smoothie and then I go to, try to go to the gym and then at home, when I get back at home after that, I'm like, eating a huge meal and then going to bed. How many calories do you think you eat in a day? Um, I try to average around two to 5,000 calories a day. Not really, but you know, a lot. I think you once told me if you don't have a thousand calories in you before noon, you're dead. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. It's really true because it's really hard for my metabolism to like jump start, And then I have trouble putting food in my body after that, which really fucks me up for the rest of the day. And then at night, like I'll power eat or so like, are you just like really tired before you get any food in your, like you use food as a also no. like to get you. So I actually don't need food for energy. I need food to make my stomach shut up because like, because you're know. just like starving when you wake up. It like churns to the point where like I can literally feel that there's nothing in there besides bile. And if I don't put anything in there, I'm going to vomit it all up. Hmm. Hmm. It's bad. But yeah, I mean, it's either granola, banana, peanuts, something. But you know yourself. Yeah, I know myself. Mm -hmm. Which is really the most important thing. It's true. What works for you. Might not work for me, but. Yeah, it's true. Um, yeah, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. But Don't you forget can, to eat your breakfast. You kids. can break your fast whenever. It doesn't have to be in the morning. 
Yeah. I just continue my fast into the afternoon sometimes. And I used to be like two bacons, two pieces of bacon, two eggs, toast kind of guy. And now I'm kind of weaning off that. Or I have for a while. And I'm like oats or like even dry cereal, like super healthy dry cereal is good for you. It's like helps power your body up. But Well, what are we thinking, boys? What are we at right now? We're at one hour on the dot. I say that's pretty weak. What um, else you want to talk about here, John? Anything I don't know. What do you guys think of my paintings? What did you guys think of them? They're cool. Like they're, they're, getting, they're getting getting somewhere. I like the colors. Yeah. There's that one that I'm working on in the back. I'm struggling with I'm, foreground. I don't know what to put in the foreground. I was going to say, those look like backgrounds to me. I want to see a foreground on there of some sort, whatever that foreground element may be. Yeah, I don't know. Different well, paint technique characters like you've done in the past um, yeah, the characters abstract ugly man. yeah i was thinking maybe some lot some like one line work like maybe some one line break faces out some, or something you should break out some like rulers and some like painters tape or something and really get some no, geometric i don't like, like not like geometric shape but just like line art abstractness to it i mean i feel like you have that like blended color on there for the viewers can't see it but um that blended color and then just like some nice clean lines on there could be could be cool. Yeah. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. Um, I'm just going to keep cranking on them until I force myself to sit with them and figure it out. But I've also been looking at a lot of other artists on TikTok, which has helped my inspiration. There's a lot of other techniques that I want to try, but I think I have to try them on some blank canvases first before I put them on those bad boys. Um, I remember the days, We're probably sitting in the same exact studio two years ago. Fuck that TikTok shit. I'm not getting on that other social media. <laughs> oh, yeah. Did you know? Yeah, you, you fight everything at it's first. It's crazy and how you ta- give I mean, like, it. you can. I like tr- TikTok. You can tri- I mean, it's tricking the algorithms. There's obviously so much bullshit on any social media platform, but like with TikTok specifically, for your case, like you're really using it for painting and all of that stuff. If you're only looking at painting stuff and your feed just starts to get filled yeah. with inspiration, like what mm-hmm. you're using it for, that's legit. And you can just like blast through reels or whatever the hell they call them. And then TikToks, TikToks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just get inspiration that way, which is tight, but there's yeah. just like so much. The, the if good... you trick it to where you're just consuming dance videos and little kids all day, it's weird. Yeah. I think, <laughs> The danger, Consuming the danger, little kids all day, <laughs> <laughs> just eating them. Nom, nom, nom. No, uh, I think, yeah, there's definitely a danger of TikTok. And I mean, everybody knows the obvious one. It's like underage people dancing and it's like over sexualized yeah. and weird and stuff like that. So then you just have to avoid that stuff. And then, cause that's literally what TikTok will always push at you at first. It's either that or like memes. So then you just avoid it. And then slowly as you continue to search for other stuff, your feed will turn to what you want. And they give it to you, which is like the opposite of Instagram where, you know, Instagram, you have to like follow somebody and find them and do all that other stuff. And then you follow that where TikTok just gives you new shit every time you look at it. And that's why I like it, especially once the algorithm like finally understands you, which is really creepy, but like it understands you and it's like, this is what you want to see. And it's dangerous too, because like TikTok's the maximum minute is this three minutes. So like you might, if you watch three videos that are at three minutes, then you just like spent nine minutes staring at your phone. And when people get on TikTok, they usually watch like 10 to 20 to 200 videos. <laughs> do you guys create content for TikTok? I do. I got a TikTok now and it's just me painting. It's not really the most entertaining, but it also, it's like a cool documentation process of like everything that's going on. Um, Sometimes I don't give a shit and I paint. Like last night I was painting really late and didn't record any of it because I was like, I don't care. I just want to chill. Do you feel like your process is better when you're not recording it? Um, I think the background and the blending stuff like that is usually pretty easy. The process, what was happening to me. Like are you overthinking it when you're on camera or like the no, performative nature? No, not at all. I'm not overthinking it, but there are times where... I am too, like last night I was pretty challenged with what I was doing and like, you know, sit in front of the canvas and just like absorb it and like think about it and look at it and try to feel it and like talk to it and see what's going on. And if I had a phone out and I was trying to make a TikTok at the same time, I wouldn't be able to get into that space. So I think that's another thing where it's like, it will limit you if you're like trying to actually dive in headfirst at something. Well, so I 
I record my band in my basement. I've got a setup, um, you know, record to Ableton. And I just, I record everything that I we've know. ever done. You do. You always <laughs> like, do. I, I record everything. You got to be um, careful around Matt because he's recording everything all the time. But one thing that I've noticed, there have been a handful of times where like I didn't have the setup or like we had just done a show or something and I don't have the recording set up. And I actually feel like some of those are some of the, our best practice performances. And it's afterwards, like my bandmates were like, you got that, right? I was like, no, no. And maybe it's just me. Like they, they still thought it was recording, but like there's something in my mind, like when I'm not recording, there's a little bit more of a freedom. Mm-hmm. Like I, and I think that's why I record all the time is just try to get used to that so that when I am recording, when I am in that moment of performance, it's just the same as everything else. Um, I mean, versus, people do that every day with in, in front of the camera, you know? I mean, all the interviewees that we go through and stuff, and people can't remember their own damn name, you know? So... That's that's valid. I mean, just being so, I mean, recording audio trained as well is the same sort of thing. And I've never been able to put my finger on why, but there is this strange freedom. And like, I I try harder and try less all at the same time. Um, And they're some of the best shit I've I haven't actually recorded, which is Um, strange. It was really weird the first day that I took that peak design tripod and I was like, okay. Let's use the cell phone mount. <laughs> I was like setting it up on the cell phone mount on the tripod, and I was like, "What am I doing?" <laughs> and I was like, "Whatever, it works." But uh, yeah, there was definitely that period where I had to get over myself for a second. I was like, "Jesus Christ!" Like, am I gonna do it? But then what I understand is that the learning curve isn't even that big. Like, it's pretty, it's pretty easy how to figure all that stuff out. But and when it comes to that recording stuff. Um, I think you just have this weird thing with tech, kind of how you were talking about your computer and you're like, you got to get in with the computer and let the technology get inside you and stuff. And we were, we had been like on phone calls or on zooms or something, or even in person, like over the shoulder at my computer and my computer's not doing what I want it to do. And I'm just getting frustrated with it. I'm like, dude, I'm getting pissed off. And you're like, stop, like it's going to hear you and it's going to be worse. <laughs> I'm like, what are you talking about? You're like, the computer, like, it reads you. It knows what you're doing. I, It'll react to you I and your energy. I stand by that statement. No. <laughs> I stand by it. You're like, hey, you take a little step to the left. Good. When you're talking about Garrett. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's like, I don't well, really know. I mean, we, we all have our own electrical field. And depending on the mood that we're in or how we're feeling, it's going to be a little bit different and it's like when you put a magnet like close to a computer. It's like how strong is your magnetic field like fucking up the computer? We, yeah, like your vibes. It'll pick that shit up, man. You gotta be chill. I said it's like a plant, you know, like yeah. how they gave it the same amount of water to plants and one they like yelled sh- at, yelled at, and said, bad "Fuck things. you!" <laughs> and the plant is like, because uh. like, wait, just, if I'm really frustrated or you know, like haven't slept for a while, like, and I can feel this chaos, just like in my body or like in my heart, my computers don't work as well. That's when Premiere is just like, boop, yeah. serious problem has occurred. <laughs> and it's usually and it's towards you. the end of a project. And sure, there might be some user error involved there because I'm just not functioning properly. But User errors and switching from the effects panel to the color panel. Yeah, oh my God, dude. <laughs> 2022. Well, I'm just accustomed to control Sing anytime I switch panels for sure. But... <laughs> Yeah, what was it? We were doing that live show with Risky Business, by the way. Shout out to Megan Cleary and those guys. Their band's awesome. But um, every, it was like a multicam sequence, only 8-bit, no 10-bit, and it, everything was proxied, and my computer was still lagging. And Matt's just like, I think you're just thinking too hard about it or something. Like, you got to chill. Restart your computer. Take a second. Relax. Are you on the new update? Like, 22? Yeah, I've been updating. Yeah. Have you noticed your panasonic footage like not working as well like do you proxy every project yeah okay i mean i'm working on a music video right now it's it's just it was two cameras but it's a bunch of different takes Mm -hmm. um and i yeah i proxy everything and after i proxy it i let it kind of sit there and just get used to that does some background stuff yeah 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 um i've just before this update like 2022 or whatever i was able to edit my fuji footage and like panasonic footage like 
seamlessly like i didn't have to proxy it everything all, was you know? fine i don't have to, to this day i still don't have to proxy my b-raw footage which is weird it is weird i never um, proxied anything but from 2022 now the fuji footage like won't even like you press play and it's just stuck like it doesn't do it just it. collapses <clears throat> upon yeah itself. Hmm. and same with the panasonic stuff for the multi-cam thing that we just cut together i had to proxy everything as well so i wonder if the like m1 chip would help that I don't know. I've seen some weird things that the M ones should like. They still need to work out some stuff with Adobe, the like Premiere, and well, I've seen some people that are working on the M one that it's like giving you weird flashes and when it comes to the stuff, when it comes to the render capabilities, it's night it, and day. Yeah, but for like sure. the workflow of it, like where it's drawing its power from, like what Adobe is trying to read, where the power comes from, RAM versus like GPU and stuff. Like, yeah, it's just a whole new program, a whole new way to read the softwares and stuff, and use ram and what yeah. capabilities the m1 chip is even doing to where like they're having to redesign how those softwares even interpret it so yeah it, i always try to limit what i'm asking premiere to do at any time you, you know it doesn't <laughs> like a, a bunch of color it doesn't like a bunch of audio so i'll turn off the i'll do the global effects Great. mute I'm the worst. Pat I'll your have, computer. It's okay. I'll have, I'm not going to go too hard on this one. Yeah, you know, we're friends. I don't, I'm not, I bought it to compute and I expect it to compute, <laughs> but you know, I'll work with it a little bit. I'm the worst. I'll have like Illustrator open mm -mm. with a couple different files, mm -mm. Photoshop open. We got my Lightroom catalog and I'm exporting in Media Encoder no. with, with Premiere. And then open. you go into his, a bunch of red giant then you go to his Google <laughs> fucking Chrome and there's so many tabs open and I'm just like, what are you doing? And he's like, my, I need those open if I don't have them open but I'm going to lose them. I'm like, what? No, I, mean, I mean, that's just like through the week, you know. It's, but that's, the, why you, that's, what? that's why you get a good computer so that you can, it can handle what you throw at it. Yeah, like, we do I'm not spending computers. thousands of dollars so that I have to do workarounds. Like I'm spending the money so that I can just throw shit at it and have it work. Yeah. Essentially. It's interesting too because like everybody always hates on Macs versus PCs because like, oh, you're paying the Apple tax. And it's like, I don't know, user friendliness also, the fact that I love the way that they look and the fact that I'll never get a virus are just like three main giant selling you points. Can get a virus. You can get malware, right. but Do you're not going to get like a PCs Trojan. In today's day and age, are they still dealing with like viruses? viruses? Like oh, yeah. That? You got to download McAfee and all that. No, not McAfee. <laughs> but you definitely you have to be careful on what sites you go on and stuff like that because like if you know you got a site that's throwing pop-ups at you or something like that like your computer's like, getting attacked. Like in today's day and age, you'd be more weary going on like the YouTube to MP3s. Going on a oh, PC. I would never go on those in the PC world. Really? Still? I don't think so. I, Unless I, I had a really good I don't I don't I mean like I knew thing. that was a thing, like PC like Macs can never get a virus like back in the day and stuff. They can get malware, but they can't have like a virus that's gonna brick your computer or something like that because it literally has to do with how the information highways are interpreted. Where like PC is a um a matrix. Like everything that's flowing through your computer is a matrix, -y, where Apple are two parallel binary codes that are going like a highway. So like viruses can't like get in there and like hide in the matrices or something. That's a really rudimentary way to put it. But that's how it was explained to me sometime by one of my buddies who's a computer nerd. Jeff Goldblum once said, life will find a way. I was watching. Okay, actually, fun fact. I just saw the first Jurassic Park last week <clears throat> for, for the, the first, first time, time ever. What? Yes, actually. And yeah. I, it was worse because I started with Jurassic Park 3. Are your parents like, <laughs> dinosaurs aren't real, you're not watching this shit? No, my parents were just like, you know, they didn't give a shit about that stuff. They were just like, you know, whatever. Um, but no, I wasn't one? allowed to watch I The Matrix. I wasn't allowed to watch any of those movies growing up. Sweet. But yeah, so then I watched the third one and I was like, Ugh. but I get it. It was funny. And then um, I watched the first one and as soon like. The, the dude just dies instantly in the very beginning of the scene oh, yeah. or in the movie. And then like seconds later, like the Jurassic Park mobiles roll up and I just started like laughing because I was like, it's the lime green and orange vehicles that like your hat. And then they had the Jurassic Park logo slapped on the side. And I was like, this is funny because like when this movie came out, this was just the Jurassic Park movie and people died. But now it's 2022 and it's been so commercialized and marketed as like Universal Studios family friendly, like Jurassic Park, rawr, kids, dinosaurs and all that stuff to where I was just like, they made a bunch of toys after that and that's cool, but like we're all just desensitized to these people just getting fucked up by dinosaurs. Look at Star Wars. Oh, it's the same, yeah. I mean, yeah. But it was just interesting it's because like it was- galactic war that's- 
I was just seeing it for the first time, though, is what I'm saying. Like, I grew up on Star Wars and I grew up on all those other films. So, like, when I see it developed in, like, Disney or, like, this or that, like, I understand, you know, like, they do a really good job of easing people into it. But then, like, growing up and seeing the Jurassic Park logo on toys and stuff and then not seeing the actual movie and then seeing it as an adult, somebody immediately gets murked. And then 10 seconds later, the Jurassic Park toy goes in the shot. I'm like, (laughs) well, it's all just a big PSA to not fuck with the embryos that you find in amber Mm -hmm. because you're going to fucking release the dinosaurs. Yeah. People are going to want to make money off of it. They're going to escape. I think that was one of the earlier films that they had a whole marketing plan behind. Like, yeah, they had product placement of like they had there's like the the gift shop in there and you could like go buy all of the stuff that was in the gift shop i had i have probably deep in a in a box somewhere the like t-rex and the triceratops of like they're like high quality like rubber and stuff it's they're really cool but they were ahead of their time with that you know now like everybody's doing that and that's probably where you make more money than in the film building a universe rather than a single film i mean that's like was doing that yeah like iron man always drives an audi you know so um but okay so what that you said jeff goldblum you know what that movie made me realize is that i don't really like jeff goldblum really i used to think he was like kind of cool i was like oh he's like this quirky guy you know (laughs) <laughs> but then um, after watching like the new search party and seeing him on like a new bunch of new commercials and everything like that, I'm just realizing I was like, this guy has no range. Like but, he's but, the same character in every movie, like this eccentric, good looking, like, oh, and then I'll talk like this and I'm fucking Jeff but have Goldblum. Have you seen his Tim and Eric sketch? No. Jeff Goldblum man group? No. <laughs> <laughs> Check it out. Okay. It, it, it yeah, maybe he doesn't have that much range, but it works. Yeah, I just, you know, I'm starting to realize that actors without range just don't really hit it for me because it's just like if I see you, and actually, you know what? You were the person who pointed that out to me, and when we talked about this on the podcast before, because I never thought about this until you said it with Dune, how they cast Jason Momoa, and then when we were talking about it with Garrett on the Garrett podcast, and you were like, I don't know why they cast Jason Momoa because I didn't see a bodyguard. I just saw Jason Momoa, and I was like, I get it, but like I don't really get it yet, and you are like, when that scene happened, like it wasn't like this cool action scene. It was just Jason Momoa doing Jason Momoa shit. Because he's like Aquaman now, you know? Yeah. It's like Aquaman running in there. Like, yeah, you, you just see you the face. Have, yeah, like those A-list bigger roles like that in a in a B role. But like maybe can, if he was like... He gets hired to be Jason Momoa. Yeah, that's exactly. lame. So it's like, you know, Jeff Goldblum doesn't need range because he gets hired to be Jeff Goldblum. At but that point, you're Dune, just an influencer, <laughs> you know? In Dune, they made the decision to shave himself and he looks like freaking... Uh, baby. Um, we know baby. Damn it. I lost his name. Baby Momoa? Nope. What? It's not even who is it? Justin, who is it? What is it from? The night. dude in Don't Be a Stranger. Um, ooh, whoa, 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 whoa. What? Give me a second. D-Boss Bobby? Oh, he's also in the guy in French Dispatch. Um, no, he's talking about a local. Huh? No. Don't Be a Stranger? In Dune? Yeah, in Dune. Hang on. But he said he reminded you of somebody in real life from D-Boss? Not D-Boss. Never mind. I'm so sorry. Sudden move. Jesus no sudden Christ. move. Christ. <laughs> Um, Don the not Don Cheadle. Don Cheadle's black. Brandon Fraser. Brandon Jesus Fraser. Christ. Oh, he does look like Brandon Fraser. The yeah, dude from the Mummy. When, when Jason Momoa shaves, he looks just like fucking Brandon Fraser. Mm. It's weird. Try and find him. Not a fan of B. Fraser. No. What about John Hamm? Yeah. Hmm. He's got he's got some range. I mean, he's always playing kind of the same thing, but he can be. He's actually kind of funny. Yeah, in comedy shit. Kind of dive around in that pool. He's not too. He doesn't take himself too seriously. Yeah, and I mean that's why people like Jeff Goldblum and Jason Momoa to me just like don't really like. I you know you see him one too many times and then they pop up and you're like, oh, I know where this character is going because they're extremely predictable and I know like what they're going to add to this plot. It's like their talent is celebrity. Yeah, it's influencer. It's not an actor. We're like, and we've talked about this before, like Johnny Depp and Leo and Brad Pitt and all those other like A-list actors that are like damn near 60 years old now, like back in their heyday when they were younger and they were being put in all these films, never went on interviews. They didn't want anybody to like know their personal life and they didn't want like 
people in their shit to like know who they were as a person because what that does is that distracts you from like who their character is on screen because like but like we, media was also not what it is today yeah but there are still like opportunities to like hey Johnny Depp, like you did great in, you know, Edward Scissorhands. Let's sit down and talk about it and stuff like that. How's your home life? Like what's going on here or there? And like they wouldn't really want to stray in that direction at all because you don't want to know who the actor is as a person. You want to know who they are as a character. And I think like actors now are like kind of going in a direction of like this influencer style. This is who I am. And I think that's really what separates, you know. What's a, is it a personal brand or... Are you yeah. trying to act in different roles? It's it? like if the camera cowboy became an actor and then they just wanted to cast me in something like that over and over and over again versus like if I was a arranged actor, you know? Like well, a, let's a talk gimmick. about your, your country music career for a second. Are you thinking mm, country yes, cow- yes, yes, camera yes. cowboy will be the moniker or have you thought about um, where you want to take that? So for those of you that don't know, camera cowboy is working on a hit album mm-hmm. that we'll be releasing I'm actually soon. here with... Yeah, I'm actually here with my media designer and uh, my producer. We have a whole 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 spread laid out for how we're going to release this promo yeah. activities. We got a few world things in the world can. tour. I think come 2024, mm. we might have to bleep that out. I don't know. If yeah, we can disclose that yet. But well, I think we're know. I think we're also going to gauge viewer reaction to uh, like exactly where we're going to put our money. The oh, I mean, the money's already the, the money's already spent. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're in deep. So. <laughs> yeah, deep. There's, there's no going back at this point. Yeah, um, we're, we signed you up. Do you have a? Should we pull pull out a set list real quick? Um, I mean, let me get the PR on the phone. Let me see if we can release that information. Where are we? At I mean, we might not. We might not want to put that out there just yet. Um, let me just think of like. Well, we're starting with the they're greatest saying you're, album. They're they're saying you're allowed to release three. Three song names off the Ooh. album of your choice. Okay. Well, it's going to be my debut album. Well, yeah, this 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 one well, album. Your, your that we've debut been spending album. All of the money, John. It's also your, your release. It's your greatest hits album too. Yeah, it's my greatest hits album. The first album and it's greatest the hits. The debut album, album is you know. the greatest hits. Album. Right. That's how I've confident we are in this. It's going <laughs> to be. I've got good. I've got the list. Um, let me just figure out which one exactly I want. You really only get see. three. Yeah, Don't make I'll people do angry. Three. I'll do three. I'll do three. I'm gonna have people in New York blowing up my phone if you say four. I swear to God. The fuck the label. Um, It's 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 better. Yeah, I got got some. It's it's Jeff (laughs) Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum. (laughs) Jeff Goldblum. Um, So, this is one of my favorite ones. It actually takes me back to my roots as a young child. Um, I used to take my dad's truck and do donuts with it when he was passed out drunk on the couch, and um, you know my mother left when she was really young and my, my, like all my sisters and brothers have died from leprosy and stuff like that. So when my dad was drunk on the couch, I would take his car keys and uh, this, this takes me back. You can die from leprosy. If you kill yourself. Yeah. Four wheel drive won't help me get rich, but it keeps me happy. And you know, now I think we're at a moment where I, I can use a four wheel drive to get rich. And I, th- I think there's a lot of people that that'll really resonate with because What's you know, a life? They're sticking never going to be rich. Drive. You said what, Trey? What's a life just sticking in two wheel drive? Yeah, yeah to it's actually not, put it in four wheel drive. It's not badass. I'll tell you that. Um, another one. Um, I went through a huge heartbreak um, in my past, and I just disappeared into the woods. And I wanted to build the biggest fire because I wanted to make sure that like I could capture something that burned with the intensity of my heart that I was feeling at that time. So capture you know, it as in you're trying to take a picture. So you're trying to get like light. No, just like I wanted to be around something that was tangible. That was as strong as the feelings that I had inside of me. I wanted to bring those out and I was like, Oh, I'll just make a giant fire. So I like got down in my underwear. No, I just wanted to be with it. Okay. Um, I got down into my underwear and I, um, just started cutting as much wood as I possibly mm-hmm. could. And I wrote this song when I was cutting and I cut so much, I had blisters all over my hand. I almost threw my back out and I'm um, surprised you didn't. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, the, the fire got pretty big, but it wasn't as intense. So, but the, the song title for that one is this ax ain't big enough to split my feelings. Um, that, the, and that one, it's just, it's so heartfelt. 
It is. It, I mean, that's what it, cause it's you like, really I was kinda, trying to that's the, you that's put yourself the, out there and like, I think you make yourself vulnerable in a way that mm-hmm. is universal. That's yeah. the song for the ladies on the album. I'm telling yeah. you now, all the dudes, it's going to be a hit. It's not one for the men. That's for sure. I mean, the, when the Achy Breaky Heart came out, like the men thought it was kind of dumb and stuff, but like, I'm calling it now on your world tour. When you brace that song out, <laughs> they're going to be throwing bras and panties up on the stage. I mean, maybe they're gonna have you on a little stool. They're going to realize them a guitar. lot. They're going to realize I'm a lot deeper than they had once thought. The emotions will be flowing. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to see. What's that? I mean, I have my personal favorite. I, I don't know. I don't want to take your third one, but. No, it's your personal favorite. Well, um, let's do it. Jesus don't load his own gun. Yeah. <laughs> that one is true. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins and put us on this earth as bullets to, you know, do his God's work for everybody else. <laughs> Like we're the ammunition. Jesus doesn't load the gun. Like we're loaded, fully loaded, to devote our lives to Christ, and that's just so Jesus you. created guns to do the God's work. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, that's uh, that's why stained glass windows are bulletproof. Yeah, that's a little teaser right there. Just, just a little you guys teaser. ever go to? I swear Catholic to God, church. guys, I'm gonna get some phone calls here in you, just you a can second. Edit this stuff Jesus. out, right? Yeah. Christ. That last one though. Okay, you guys got a sneak peek. The stained glass windows aren't bulletproof wait no that's our bulletproof no they are yeah stained glass windows are bulletproof Jesus um, Christ, are don't try to come into my church Damn, with none of that bullshit with uh devil shit because these windows are bulletproof that's there's a whole story behind that song too now which church is that exactly that's any church that the lord jesus christ and first of all i just need to preface this album through jesus christ all things are possible so just remember that can can i ask you a personal question what's up <sighs> Many, many times, um, the Lordeth floweth freely. Um, I mean, look, I'm, I'm rep- repping my Leonard Skinner shirt right now. I mean, those are my roots. So, as of like a couple years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Ever since I bought that damn cowboy hat at Wall Drug, shit oh, was dude. never the same. Well, what happened is I realized I was super sad, and country just spoke to me. And I was like, oh, man, this is what these guys are talking about. And then I was like, okay. Have you ever cried listening to a country song? Fuck yeah, every day. All right, respect, respect. Yeah, of course. Every day? Uh, no, you, you not t- so much anymore. Okay. But yeah, dude, some of the I haven't, I haven't gotten a cry in in a long time. Really? I haven't cried in a while. I teared That's up. Probably I teared a good up. Thing. I teared up during this animal documentary I was watching like a month or so ago. On the real, you know, I what haven't show like cried. Cried makes though. me cry every time I watch it. My dog is getting old though. Oh no, Daisy man, it's gonna break. A, a, her- a nice heroic dose of mushrooms might help you out there. That. Might help me get past it, but that's that's gonna be a tough one when that happens. <laughs> no, I mean help you cry. That is. <laughs> that's, that's yeah. It's, that'll it's, that'll do it too. Right, well, the camera's dead, so. Huh? The camera's back on. It's just battery exhausted. It's gonna oh. shut off here in just a second. But yeah, so like, um, crying's cool. I mean, would you say you cry like once once a month, twice a month? Um, we'll once, keep that once a year. Uh, we'll keep that dis- information disclosed daily. We'll keep that information disclosed. Keep that up for but interpretation. You know who my most recent? Um, it's healthy to cry. No shame on crying to anyone listening. Like I need to cry more. I think if you haven't cried in a long time, that's kind of a good thing. But at the same time, um, if you're if you're bottling it all up, that's a bad thing. But it just means you might not have some crazy shit going on in your life. Um, my most recent inspiration has been Oliver Tree with his new album Cowboy Tears. Mm-hmm. Um, it's great, and the you one, might get a cease and assist letter from him if you don't be careful. The one that song that I don't agree with is the first one on the track on the new on the new album, but it's Cowboys Don't Cry, and I just want to let Oliver Tree know that I think he got his history wrong there because you know cowboys talk about crying in the rain all the time. Mm. Blue eyes crying in the rain. If I do recall in that music video, he does cry quite a bit, though. Maybe he's not a cowboy. Is that what he's saying? Oof. See, Ooh. I'm going to get some phone calls because oh, you just no. said that. I'm just kidding, Oliver. <laughs> I'm just kidding, bro. Don't come at me. Jeff Goldblum. Don't at me, bro. <laughs> fucking also, bro speaking of albums, uh, Electric Holdra is a semi-local band. Ipsy. Yeah, South wait, East hold Michigan. on. Let, we're, since we're wrapping up, Matt, this is your opportunity to plug everything that you want to plug for our listeners. 
but electric. Well, yeah, that's kind of what, what I, I was what getting to. So, right, cool. Um, electric Holdra's band, kind of semi-local, and uh, they, they've been recording an album for a couple of years, and they brought me in, and I've recorded a couple tracks with them. So I'm playing some keyboards on this new album, which... Nice. That's the one you posted on your Instagram this morning, right? Yeah, it dropped today on all of the streaming sites and their band camp, and... Uh, Hell yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm actually working on a music video for them for one of their songs Ooh. as well. So that'll be coming out here kind of soon. Let me know if you need any help. Semi local, semi global. We're they're, we're talking about I might I might play a show with them in Hamtramck in May for the, like their CD release party. Anybody that I know in that band? Um, maybe Bobby Marks. I think he. I don't know. Nope. Check them out. Okay. You should know them. Okay. Jeff Glob- it's good. Goldblum. Jeff Goldblum. Jeffy G, baby. And then, uh, yeah, Tina in the Sand is the other, that's my surf band project. And we're working on getting an album together and then some music videos. And Tina in Japan is our, <laughs> that's our goal. We're trying to do a, yeah, a short Tina Japan in tour Japan. in uh, 2023. Well, Tina in the Sand's a great fucking band. And I'm not just saying that because you're my friend and I support my friends. But I really think that Tina in the Sand has some potential. And like if the, somebody had some money that they could throw behind it, like to get like a some sort of bar to have like a monthly tiki night or something like that would be very, very cool. That'd be fun. Tina yeah. in Japan is kind of genius though. <laughs> the, the, the surf rock scene in Japan is definitely it, still it well has, and alive. Yeah, really? Been, yes. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, dude, get there. That's, you should start throwing some money at some like paid advertising in Japan for Tina and the Sand once you guys get some content. Well, we got, so the first thing is we need to get some recordings up on Bandcamp and we need to get, we need to get those things out there, then start working on our SEO, then play some more shows and, there's a marketing plan in place. All your marketing, like when you can choose a demographic or where to put it, throw some in Japan, see what happens. The issue is we're a one person marketing team. Yeah. It's just you. Being you. It's just just me. (laughs) So you're, you're, wait, I didn't know my manager was also doing some other side project. Oh, I moonlight. Like, why do you think I don't sleep? There was no That's NDAs true. or there's, C, uh, there's no time to do marketing for Tina in the Sand. Okay, so, so you got to make, sure you gotta make that time my, for that. Uh, the time that I'm paying you for is spent well. But we're we're playing a show April 9th at the Blind Pig. Yep, Ooh. we're opening for Chirp. Nice. Yeah, I saw that. So it should be kind of cool. Jay and all those guys. Like, I've known them for a very long time. Actually, only Jay and Brian and the original Chirp members have all left. So I've known Jay for since my childhood, and he's actually a pretty influential guy to me. So, yeah, they're great. I'm looking forward yeah. to that show. Mm-hmm. They're fun as fuck. That'll be fun. Yeah. Um, but anything else you want to plug? Inside, outside the box? Inside the box, inside the box, outside, inside the, the, box? The, box, outside the box. That's going to be a continuing thing. Um, it's hopefully, it'll be a fun Instagram account to follow, if nothing else. Mm-hmm. And, I think it's uh, a fun Instagram account. I really like it. Yeah, I'm that. Yeah, I don't have a lot of my own projects. I do a lot of work for other people and shit that I can't really even talk about. Talk about. That's how you That's know fair. you're doing cool That's shit. That's fair. Um, well, thanks for coming on. I appreciate. Thanks for us giving me. you or you giving us your Friday. It is Friday, right? Yes, yeah, it is Friday. Friday afternoon. Um, thanks to all of our viewers who are sticking around. Uh, our viewership is going up and up every time, and it's great. And I love that you guys watch us so and listen to us because our YouTube is totally different views. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, so yeah, stick with us. We got more podcasts lined up, and we're gonna have some more releasing after this. Bye, guys. Peace. You want to say bye, Matt? <laughs> you gotta put on the ski mask. Peace. <laughs> <laughs>